excited to have everyone uh, here in the Zoom, as well as uh, live streamed or watching this at a later date, uh, talking to us today about sort of bringing science into art, which is a topic near and dear to my heart, being a mundane scientist and an SCA artist. <laughs> um, but this is very much not about me. Um, hi, I'm I'm Enlise, for those of you that don't know me. But what I did today was pull together uh, five amazing scientists and artists within the mid-realm and brought them together to get a whole host of ideas on this idea of how we pull science into art and what that really even means. Um, so I'm going to uh, briefly have each of our panelists introduce themselves, talk a little bit about sort of their blending of science and art, and um, maybe have them include a favorite historical scientific fact if they've got one on hand. So we are going to start with my current arts and sciences champion, and that is Sir Callum. Thank you, Your Majesty. Uh, as she said, I am Sir Callum, the uh, arts and sciences champion for the Middle Kingdom. Uh, favorite historical science fact is that in the 1500s, the Italians stopped bothering heat treating their armor. And that's actually what led me into sciencing my art. I was wondering how did they treat? Why did they stop? And where did that lead? So for me, science is all about asking why or how or the other five questions that we had uh, Her Excellency Serena talk about at the keynote speech. So that's, that's what it is, science, find the answers. Perfect, well, I think that's a fabulous transition and our keynote speaker, Her Excellency Countess Serena is another one of our panelists. So Serena, if you'll give us a brief introduction as well. So um, I'm Serena and my thing is rearing silkworms with um, period medieval methods. And um, let me think of, um, something that I learned, uh, a scientific thing that I learned when I was processing my silk in the um, realm of dyeing silk, that there's a dye called uh, Brazil wood that you can adjust the color of based on pH. So if you want it to be a little more, I mean, it's, it's usually like a reddish color, but if you want it to be a little more orangey, you can make it more acidic, or if you want it to be more purplish, you can make it more basic. So you can really customize the shade of your dye based on pH. That's fun. There was a whole class on dye molecules this morning that was just fascinating, all about chemistry. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, so that's good, add to that. I'm going to, let's see, next on my screen is Mistress Camilla, if you would be kind enough to introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Baroness Mistress Camilla. I've been teaching knitting in the society for quite a while. And uh, the, the science fact that uh, got me interested in various things is the fact that when wool gets wet, it generates a small amount of heat. When the Brendan voyage was recreated with the sewn oxide boat, sailing the North Atlantic. They picked up a fisherman off the Faroe Isles to work the crew with them. And first thing he would do every morning, he would get up, he would dunk his wool mittens in the North Sea because they weren't gonna get any wetter and they weren't gonna get any colder. And because wet wool, i.e. a hair, can generate a small amount of heat, this is why to this day, you cannot send wet hair through UPS because of the risk of spontaneous combustion. I, I am learning so much already and we are not even five minutes in. This has been so much fun. Um, I, I totally, I did this for myself, I think. So, okay, next up on my list of panelists, I have her, uh, the Honorable Lady Anne Milligan. Anne Milligan. Thank you, Your Majesty. Um, my name is Anne Milligan and my art is printmaking. The science that I use in my art is more the actual process of if I do this, how will this turn out? 
So, but there is some science facts about there is a distinct difference between both period inks and modern inks if they use the, um, between using vine black ink and bone black ink. And that's because the primary ingredients they use for those are in bone ink, as you would imagine, is burned bone that is then ground and used as a pigment. In the vine, it's burned vegetation that is ground and used as a pigment. And it actually, to my eye, the um, vine black is darker. So if you want a distinct dark black, use that. If you want a blue cool tone to your black, use the bone blue. More, more fun color and dye and pigment and just cool, cool facts, cool facts. Okay, last and certainly not least is Master Millicent Bober, who is uh, perhaps one of the most diverse art scientists I know. Uh, thank you, I'm Millicent, and uh, I'm actually was elevated to the Order of the Laurel for science. Um, mostly I'm into book arts, uh, costuming, dance, uh, calligraphy, sticking gold to things. Um, I'm a little, I'm one of those stuffed laurels, but uh, specifically I was elevated for my experimentation. Uh, one of the things I'm really into, I love the history of science and how we have different theories that come up and, and change. And uh, I think one of my favorite things is how colossal blunders and failures uh, turn out making us move forward. Uh, you know, we were talking about chemistry and the chemistry of dying. You think about it, a lot of that came from the science of alchemy, uh, where for hundreds of years, alchemists were trying to turn one metal into another metal, and they failed miserably. Uh, they never achieved that goal, but so much new knowledge came out of it that affected pigments, that affected metallurgy, it affected, you know, the armoring and dyeing. And again, no art exists in a vacuum. And that's always very uh, fascinating to me where each art touches all of the others and how they influence each other. So true. And I think that's why a lot of us end up going down the rabbit holes we do where you get all of these interconnected things. And, uh, you know, I, I like to refer to the SCA as, as it's a lot of hobbies within one larger hobby and somehow you do all of them. I think we've all found aspects of that. Um, so this is, uh, thank you all for being part of this panel. Thank you for the introductions and already fun science facts and, and interesting ideas. Um, this is my reminder to our live audience to please feel free to come off mute and ask questions or pop questions you have in the chat as we go. Um, I have a few questions to get us started, but I'm hoping this will be a very interactive panel, um, despite not being able to do this in person. Uh, so I guess my first question, and we've covered a little bit of this with the diversity of the different things that you all do, but what can be scienced? Everything! <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how do you science anything? Well, um, in my instance, you've got the hard sciences of studying the artifacts and the social sciences of who made it and why. Because in the late 16th century, not only do you have the transition between knitted hosen and sewn hosen, you've got the social science aspect of it as a social program when you have widows and orphans being taught how to knit in order to supply the market and earn their daily bowl of gruel. So you've got both there. Um, I think for me, one of the, I think it's the approach you reach at for the particular art. Uh, if you're, you know, like you said, you have different types of science, you've, you've got quantifying, you've got experimentation, uh, but it's the approach. For me, you know, uh, book arts, dance, uh, costuming, uh, I had no problem applying scientific sciencyness to it. And you might think that's not right with dance. I mean, how do you quantify dance? Um, but there were ways. Anything that you can systematically look at to solve a question 
is science. Uh, there's a, a Laurel near us who went through the Macy Jowski Bible and counted the colors of socks in the illuminations to see what would have been done, what, what color socks are appropriate for a knight to wear or for a king to wear in that time period in that place. Anything that you can systematically look at to answer a question is science. Excellent point, Callum, because I think a lot of times we look at a particular object in the SCA, you know, we see, you know, I want to make that. Um, and uh, what goes from that, just recreating that object to science is then now looking at the other evidence that's around that object. And even you ask questions too, like with the uh, uh, Mistress Constanza's excellent uh, Macy Jowski project you mentioned, uh, is there actually a difference of the colors worn by different social classes or genders? You know, you don't necessarily know until you do that quantitative work. And it's, it's a way of getting a deeper understanding of the project you're interested in. Those are, are excellent examples. So getting into sort of the, the nitty gritty of this kind of thing, um, perhaps, and how did you decide in yours what you needed to know? How did you decide which which aspect of, of a project you would sort of like to science around or which questions you needed to ask to do what you do better and more and differently? Well, some of mine started in my honors project since I am mundanely a printmaker. That is my, my degree. But for SCA purposes, it came down to I wanted to teach other people to do it. And I realized if I needed other, wanted other people to print making in the way I do, which is visual pictures, um, I needed to make sure I knew all the price points and the affordability of it. Because as an art student, it's not that affordable. <laughs> I used my student loans to pay for my art supplies. And I know not everybody can do that. So I know there are a lot of modern wood possibilities since my current focus is woodcut. There are different possibilities that can be used. So I decided to take a set of different woods and I'm going to cut the same picture out of each one. And I'm going to then print said picture as many times as I need to for the main larger print and decide which wood to use. And that way, when people ask me, hey, I wanna get started, what wood should I use? I can ask the, I say, I can first off say this is a difficult question, but do you have a, a budget? And if you have a budget, here's my recommendations because I want to be able to answer those questions instead of them going away disappointed and not being able to carve. I have a similar project going on. Sorry, Your Majesty. Um, um, I asked the leading experts in my field, I asked Dr. Susan North of, of the Victorian Albert Museum. Kirsty Buckland, who wrote the article about mammoth caps, um, one of the authors of the Tudor Taylor, uh, Dr. Jane Malcolm Davis, and uh, Leslie O'Connell Edwards, who's working on her doctorate at Oxford, what materials were used in period knitting needles. 200 years of uh, textile history, uh, academia, they didn't know. So I have designed an experiment. I haven't actually implemented it yet, but I've designed an experiment to figure out what would have survived because so far nothing has survived. So I've got two types of wood, bone, antler, horn. I've cut them all the same size. I know uh, what parallel uh, on the globe I live in. I haven't tested the pH of my soil, I'm going to make up little sample packs and bury them in different parts of my backyard and my sister's backyard because her dog can pee on it. I don't have a dog. And I'm going to see how they degrade over time because I've asked the experts and the experts do not know in this case. And as, as far as um, expanding on the materials part of it, it it's not only, you know, only some of the materials survived, uh, yeah. like, like you were saying, but also if you dive into the, the socioeconomic 
reasons for why people use certain things. Um, not everybody who made knitting needles or made printmaking materials had the money to buy uh, <laughs> brand new materials. They often used what they had left over from something else. So sometimes it's not necessarily the best thing to use, but it was a thing to use and they used it, not because it was ideal, but because that's what they had and they needed to make the thing. And so that's what they did. Yeah, I think a, a lot of science comes out of trying to answer the questions that we don't have answers to. Uh, like, you know, uh, a lot of period recipes will leave out certain things, um, recipes for pigments or dyes or cooking recipes you know, there's assumed uh, steps and, and ingredients that we don't necessarily know. And that's where digging and experimentation really helps. And I always like to say, okay, what was available? What tools did they have on hand? I love Anne's uh, example of the wood. What woods were available to them? And just through that experimentation, figuring out what was the best economically, but what was the best for durability? What was the best for the quality of the print? Mm -hmm. I think uh, Mistress Camilla makes a very good point of when you've got your question, look to see what options are available to you to help find that answer. Can you reach out to, to experts who know this kind of thing? Do you have, can you find books that discuss this kind of thing? Or are you stuck with, here are some things and I'm just gonna try and experiment my way through them. You know, which, which method can you use or should you use to find answers? What's, what's going to generate better results quicker for you? Now, if you can talk to an expert, that'll save you quite a bit of time in your workshop of making mistakes that have already been covered by other people. Uh, we've all had that instant where we were searching for an answer and then boom, here's a book that's already got it. Paul, <laughs> as a question for all of you, I mean, some, some of you all work in academia or other fields where you have experience and, and uh, practice reaching out to experts. But for those who don't, how do you start looking for an expert in a field? And how do you go over that, that uncomfortable hurdle of, I'm just, you know, Joe Bob in my house in Kentucky, and I want to talk to, you know, the leading expert in XYZ, and why would they talk to me? So how do you, how do, you do that? How do you find them? And then how do you get them to pay attention to you? Well, my experience, oh, sorry. Uh, my experience was um, I kept seeing the same name over and over in modern sources referring to the medieval subject that I was looking at. And I just found an article that had his contact information and sent him an email. Um, and there, for people who are intimidated by experts, they're, they're just people too. Um, and they're probably really big geeks about the thing that they've spent their lives becoming an expert in and, and will probably love to share that information with you. So I would encourage people not to be afraid by anybody who they think is untouchable. They're, they're just people. Ask them. They'll love to talk about it. Especially museums, because museums sometimes have to justify their existence by the number of inquiries that they receive. So if you write a polite, coherent request to any museum anywhere, it's a lot easier than it used to be. But say, tell them, um, I'm an independent scholar. I'm interested in this topic. Um, there was a piece of jewelry from the Museum of London. I wrote to them and said, uh, OK, this particular piece of jewelry is not in your database. It's not in your pictorial database. And it's not in the book that you published on the topic. So they wrote back and said, here's the information. And um, in a previous instance with the Museum of London also, I wrote to him and said, I saw this stocking in your book. Can you send me more information? They photographed it for me 
next to a tape measure. So that was a win. So just write a polite, coherent letter to especially museums and you will be pleasantly surprised more often than not. I always say, I understand why it's difficult. A lot of us um, science-y art nerds are very introverted. Uh, email is great. I, I love the, uh, the quiet in-person ability of email. Uh, I, I've only done it once. Uh, and I was going to say what Serena said too. You start looking through uh, the, that list at the end of the article and you start noticing names and you start feeling very well read. I feel like I know who the top people in Silver Point are right now. Uh, but I did email the Cleveland Museum of Art and asked a question about drying and they, the, they got right back to me and like say, uh, here, read this book. And I went out and I got the book. It had all the answers and I was thrilled. But yeah, I, I always say too, one of the best things is flip to the end of the article, look at their sources. <laughs> Oh yes, uh, that Lucia, you're right. The uh, turnaround time is not always fast. It depends no. on how busy they are. Yeah. It, it, yeah, conversations are not always speedy. Um, they, they, they have their own lives amazingly enough, but uh, it, it is amazing what just a simple email can get you. Um, let's see. So. We've we've talked a little bit on a whole lot of things, um, and and we've talked a little bit about about this idea of of one question breeding lots of questions and interests and all the rest. And so here's here's a maybe a tough question: How do you decide where to stop? Like, how do you decide when you know enough and you should stop this rabbit hole and maybe focus on this one? Or do, are you guys like just keep going on seventeen things at once? The struggle is real. <laughs> what is this word you use, this stop? I am unfamiliar yeah. with this. Well, okay, so so let's, let's a very tangible example then. Say that I want to recreate object X and I've decided that in recreating object X, I wanna understand how period tools versus modern tools affect the process. Do I, then decide to make my own period tools? And then do I need to make the tools to make the period tools? So I've got to learn some like blacksmithing or something? Like, where does it become okay to say, I'm gonna pay for someone or I'm just gonna buy this or I'm gonna, where, where do I stop my process of becoming the expert that gets to the final project? I think, I think one of the big things is just, um, what part of the project gives you the most excitement? And I think that's an important point that, that focus. It's one of the things I suffer from. I, I, I have a huge lack of focus. Uh, a lot of times too, though, you, you look at this and then it leads you to that and leads it to that and leads it to that. And you end up that the thing five steps down that you were not interested in at all to begin with is now your passion. Uh, but you have to realize that original project is now abandoned. Uh, so really, I think it's very important for you to figure out what is important for you to do. What, what is the thing that is most exciting for you? I think I agree with that. Um, I, uh, oops, oh yeah, I'm unmuted, sorry. Um, I, I find that, that in, in my progression in, from rearing silkworms into processing soap, that there's certain things along the way that I find myself saying, oh, what's that all about? And I go that way, but there's also 10 other different things that just didn't interest me that I could have gone deeper into, but that wasn't, that wasn't the thing that made me say, oh, why is this? Or, huh, that's weird. What, what's going on there? So I, I agree with, with Millicent there. For me, the period tool things really rings true because I've, I've had that question asked of me as, as an arts competitor. And it started with my professors in school and I asked them how old the tools were. And as far as I can tell with my research and talking to my professors, they're the same tools, they're just made in a modern way. What the tools do and how they cut the wood is still the same. So for the people that want to get stuck on the why didn't you make your own tools? Well, I'm fairly certain that Albert Durer didn't make his own tools. He probably bought them. So I'm going to buy mine. 
it's just that simple. Making the tools does not interest me. Learning to blacksmith and get the tools down to one millimeter Vs to do tiny carving does not interest me. I'd rather do the carving. <laughs> so I'd rather buy my tools. But that is a good point. You can go that far. And in some ways, I'm doing that as well because I'm hoping to teach a wood carving class. So I've gotten a new set of inexpensive but Japanese style wood cutting tools to see if I can buy them as loaner sets for beginners for the class so that I can present my class with the, these are what I use, but this is their price point. And, but these, what I have loaned you to use today are at this price point. And here's where you can find them if you're getting started. Given the quality of most Japanese made tools, I'm not very worried, but I am going to work with them for a while myself first. There's definitely a lot of different ways to take that. And sometimes it's worth trying it and determining it's not your interest or, you know, hey, in period, if someone was doing what I'm doing, they would have also purchased. So it's OK. Um, I find myself, you know, I want to do my, my thing being fiber arch. I want to do a lot of my, my fiber arch with, you know, appropriately correct sewing needles and things like that. They're a pain in the neck to work with. And if I have to go fast, I just can't. <laughs> But I'm glad that I know, right? Even if I'm not going to most of the time because I don't have all day to sit and sew. We do I, have a question. Yeah. Yes. I was going to say, there's some questions in the chat. Yeah, I was I gonna would, say, I'm going to try and get to some of those. We have a question coming in from uh, Svana. Is it ever too late to start researching something completely new to you? No. Nope. No. Nope. 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 <laughs> it, it might be a, just a short lived fancy, but no. Uh, I would say. 2 a.m. 2 a.m. is too yeah, late. Yeah. Wait, wait late. until the morning. Uh, write a note though so that you don't stay up street thinking about it all night. I, mean, I would say, uh, how many of you have started something new in the last month that you know you weren't interested in the past? See? Yeah, no, it's never too late. And we're constantly finding new things, I think, and asking new questions. Um, so another question coming in from from the chat have you ever found a dead end where being an independent scholar meant that some resources were out of your reach because you weren't affiliated or you know an expert or in that field not um, yet if so if so how did you find a way around it <laughs> yes I'll say, yeah. callum has a yes i'm seeing lots of no's but callum had a yes so, um, go callum in my how to decorate armor current passion. One of the methods of decorating the armor is fire gilding, mercury gilding. Oh. That requires working with vaporous mercury, which is all kinds of bad. And me as a private amateur person interested in this, I do not have the, the chemical Equipment. goods to safely <laughs> work with that. And surprisingly, the people who do aren't real interested in sharing their equipment with some random guy with no <laughs> credentials who might cause an EPA incident in their laboratory. Imagine that. And so there are some hard limits that you can eventually run into. And OK, at that point, if I cannot go there, start looking around for what is an acceptable substitute. You know, I, if I cannot mercury plate, maybe I can electroplate. It, it's not quite the same thing, but it is close enough given the limits of life in 21st century America. I would say too, I think, um, you know, I, I'm fortunate enough that I work at a university, so I do have access to uh, Ohio link and the uh, JSTOR and online research databases, which I love. Uh, for those of you who don't, though, there's a lot of people in the SCA who do and are willing to share articles. I know I've had lots of people send me messages saying, hey, I found a citation. Can you access this article? And sometimes I can and sometimes I can't. Because remember, the academics are limited to uh, their university may not have access to that particular journal. They may not have purchased it. And I think one of the big things that holds up is uh, language. A lot of excellent sources are only available in, you know, Swedish or something, and, and that's limiting as well. But these are the same limitations that you would run up as an academic. And, you know, I could see someone wanting 
to research mercury gilding at a university not being able to because their department just is not willing to invest in the equipment for it. So these, these are barriers to everyone and you, you find your way around. I think it's often a, a safety or cost issue that is what the one we run into the most. Um, I had a question here in my brain and I can't think what it was at the moment. Oh, um, I was going to point out. Uh, so, yes, within the SCA, there are a lot of people who work for academic institutions and have access to those journals um, and can help you find what you need, hopefully. Uh, if you don't, want to do that route or you want want a little bit more direct access a lot of local universities if you can prove that you live within their area will do a community borrower system and you can actually become a patron of their university for a certain amount of money per year cost generally depends on the size of the university and how how large their collection is but uh, look into those kinds of things um, the other thing and i use this as as an actual researcher as sometimes uh, things are behind paywalls that i don't have access to as Millicent said uh, if you just email the people who wrote the paper that you can see, you know, an abstract for or something like that, a lot of times they will send you a copy of it <laughs> um, because they can and they want their research to be shared and used. Um, so do not hesitate to contact people. Uh, the worst that can happen is they say no. Um, but that's that's been my experience. And don't forget the reference <laughs> librarians. Yes, yes, your librarians can help you with uh, interlibrary loans, and that's true even at your local non-academic libraries as well. So there's amazing, and I know Fiat has, I think, two classes this afternoon on book research and things like that. So she is a superior source for those kinds of things. Um, I did have a quick question for Anne. There's a question in the the chat asking for the the uh, Japan the inexpensive Japanese tools you're looking at because they're a woodworker looking for low cost entry into that that wow. area as well. I saw that question. I actually answered it. Okay, perfect, perfect. Do you <laughs> want to share the general group or did, did you? Oh, okay, there you go. I see it now. Um, Sorry, I'm behind. I'm behind. Pronounce it wrong, <laughs> but it's uh, Karakuri. And everything else is literally written in Japanese, including the instructions. So <laughs> literally, perfect. you know, they, I can show people how to use them properly, but it's like, hmm, yeah, these are definitely hands-on tools because unless you can read Japanese. I will say too, with the part of the passion of science, getting back to our, our previous topic about where do you stop? I always said I was only going to do uh, period tools and materials on a award scroll once. I just wanted to do it once to see what it was like. And maybe some people can do that, but I found out um, that there was a quality to it. And sometimes, you know, you need to use that material, that tool to see the difference. And I've always wanted the best tools. And sometimes the only way to get the appropriate tool is to make the tool yourself. I don't want to be a tool maker though. The good news is you can almost always find someone in the SE who does want to be a toolmaker. You just have to pair up. We like those people. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Um, so I guess sort of bringing this back to sort of a general question. So what, why go through all of these sort of processes to experiment and try and science and art? I mean, what's why? What's the point? What do you get out of it? <laughs> I've affected it. How could you even ask that? <laughs> what do you get out because of it? It's my job to ask the hard questions and the weird questions. Oh, you're so mean, Your Majesty. <laughs> I, I, I think well, one of my things is, is just again, to get a deeper understanding of what you're doing. Um, you know, we can look at a dress and a painting and say, I want that dress and make it. But, and you can look good and it's perfectly appropriate and great and your friends will love it and you'll get lots of photos taken of you at the event. Uh, but I like to know, is this dress typical of the time period? Am I using the right materials? Do I have the right number of lacing rings? Um, do I have the right decoration on the sides? Is this appropriate to my class? Is this, you know, there's so many questions and questions and questions that can build off of it uh, when you start really investigating and looking at a thing. And that gives you a deeper understanding of the time period of the craft, of the, the work of the medieval craftsmen, and um, 
I think you you like and appreciate the dress better. I just maybe it's just a, a need to be right. <laughs> I always have to be right. I need to know. Well, for for me and my project personally, there's still I have this unanswered question. Um, modern modern domestic silk moths were a wild species at one time, and that species still exists today in China. And I want to get my hands on those worms and rear them as they were when they were first being domesticated by the Chinese 4,000 years ago. And why do I want to do it? I just, I, I, I want to know. I want to know what they were like. Are, how similar are they? How different are they? What's the silk like from the original species compared to the species that everybody uses now for commercial silk production? I'm just, well, I just want to know. T touching on that, this is a hobby. Hobbies should be fun. So why do we do it? Because it brings us joy. This joy might not be understandable by any other person, but if it makes us happy, that's what we should be doing. Well, some people juggle geese. I make spreadsheets. <laughs> So uh, then in, in, on, on a, the, the opposite topic, uh, is it okay to not experiment? Like if my joy is not in the experimentation, is that okay? What is your joy? Follow that joy. Yes. If, if experimentation isn't your, your thing, do your thing. Do the thing that brings you joy. Doesn't matter what somebody else thinks of it. As long as you're not actively harming anybody else with it. Well, I'll say too, yes. when you um, talk about experimentation, a lot of times it can become a very, very big topic. Uh, like, you know, I want to try, you know, I had a friend, uh, Nadezhda, she, she decided to do 50 shades of gray and spin 50 different wools. I think she's up to like 250 now. Uh, so you can say after a while, it, it just grows and grows and grows and grows. Do I have the time and energy to do this huge of a project or do I just want to try a couple of different ones? Um, what is interesting to you. And, you know, there's other ways of science other than experimentation. Obviously, experimentation is, I, I'm near and dear to my heart, but I've also done a lot of observation. You know, um, let me show you my spreadsheets where you're just looking at things and, and writing things down and looking for trends. Uh, that didn't involve any experimentation at all. That involved counting. I actually, you know, for my crock dress, I went through 150 images and counted the lacings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, because I wanted to know. Yep. Math is everywhere. I've, I've found that out. People think, oh, you just, you just sit down and you knit something. No, there's math. There's a lot of math. There's math, and then there's geometry, and then there's more math. A lot more math than I ever thought I would have to deal with. Don't scare them. Math is good. <laughs> So I think the math relevant to your joy is fun. Math for math's sake, unless your joy is math, is less fun. Yeah. I mean, I, I speak with a mother who is a mathematician, so I, yeah. I don't get it, but it's her joy. Yeah. And sometimes you have to do something that you're not really super jazzed about to get the, to the thing that you are jazzed about. Yeah. Um, and I touched on that a little bit in my speech that if you do something from beginning to end to you know, experiment or learn whatever process and you find out there's something you just really can't stand one step in the process, hand it out for somebody else to do. If you've done it already and you have an understanding of what's involved, then you have an understanding of, of what might the logical progression be at the end of the project or, or things that you could change about it. Um, but I don't think it's necessary to enjoy absolutely every aspect of your project or to even do every single aspect of your project. That's a good thing to hear other peers since I'm not one yet say that because there are certain things that I can't do. Like one of the things I initially wanted to do learn how to make period make even though modern inks can't be that different. I'm sure some of how the, the oil products are processed is, is more refined. Um, but I have an autoimmune disease that all oil products trigger. So even if I do it, I may do it once to say I understand it, and then I'll be done. 
it won't be something I carry on because I can't. And even when I teach, I'm using modern washable oil inks, aren't as, and I wear gloves all the time. Not just to keep me messy because I'll get messy anyway. It's ink, I get messy. But it's just to avoid the oil soaking into my skin. So, so some things that you can't do, literally, so. Well, in some instances too, technology has marched on for a reason and new tools have been developed for a reason. I mean, you look at some tools, like some of the, the early woodworking tools and the modern tools look identical because there was no need for them to develop and change. You know, a chisel is a chisel is a chisel and it works great. Uh, but certain other things like our calligraphy pens, um, there's a reason why the modern uh, fountain pen and the modern cartridge pen developed. And as much as I love my little feather quill, it's a pain in the butt constantly recutting it. And if somebody needs calligraphy in an hour, I'm going for my modern pen. <laughs> the end result doesn't look different to the, uh, to the end user. So yeah, there's, there's times where you have to make those intelligent decisions uh, based on, does it actually affect the project? And, and, and coming, no, going going into that, I was I was just thinking with your example of a chisel is a chisel, um, you know, with His Majesty being a woodworker, I can answer a chisel is not always just a chisel, um, and in some cases the modern technology that makes it different is the hardness of of the metal and how fine an edge you can get on it, and it's all really frustrating to stop every thirty minutes and sharpen your chisel versus you know once a week. So Which is yeah. why the technology advanced. Yeah, there was a reason. <laughs> You, you understand how it would have been different, but you're okay with not doing that because you have other things to do in your life these days. So I think that's that's really it's it's finding. I think I think as much as anything out of this conversation, what I'm hoping people have heard is that it's okay to ask questions as many or as deep as you want. It's okay to not ask questions, and on this this you know continuum of of depth of knowledge, wherever it is that you find your joy. It's okay to be there wherever it is on that. And you will find other people at that same level who find the same things fascinating that you do and make the same sort of modern or period decisions that you do. And, and, and all of it's okay as long as we're all having fun together and sharing joy. Yeah, no, I've just got and I've just got a whole bunch of nods going on, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Sum it up, we can we're just we're done now. Um we, we are can't and, is uh just a love fest i'm loving the chat <laughs> the chat has been stellar um it, it's it's unfortunate that that won't go out with the recording but that's okay you just have to be here well, for something it can yes andreas was that <laughs> andre uh, andreas apparently is going to send the chat out who knows and i, I can um, save the chat people in the chat <laughs> we'll see um I, I guess I, I I run to the list of my my pre-planned questions, and I keep hoping the chat will pop up with more questions. But it's mostly just people celebrating, asking questions, and uh, enjoying changing things, and all of that. Um, we're we're about a qu uh, quarter to the hour. Um, oh, we got a question there. What's the coolest thing you've ever scienced? Oh, <laughs> we'll start with Anne. You. <laughs> Uh, honestly, I don't even relate to what I focus on. It was learning from my Laurel how to test fabrics and burn spots and tell which are cotton, which are linen, and which have nasty polyester stuff in them. Because <laughs> it's a real simple thing. You take a little swatch, you burn it. Cotton pretty much goes completely ash. Linen will have a little bit of form, but goes close to ash. Wool. You, it ends up, you feel the oil in it, feel the lanolin. Anything with polyester smells like plastic burr. And it takes, you know, inch by inch to figure that out. And I even actually used that at school because I had some random fabric that I was going to screen print on and wanted to know what it was. So I took it outside in our rock garden at school and <laughs> lit a bit. Anyone else have a cool thing they want to share that they've scienced in the SCA? I, I think my favorite is still the gold thread. Um, I, like I said, mostly my, my wheelhouse is book arts and I was teaching a class on gilding uh, and I made some stupid remark about, and this is how you put gold on anything. 
And of course, uh, someone in the audience was like, how would you do it on thread? And I was like, oh, I <laughs> uh, don't know. And that led me into a huge research wormhole, um, which ended up involving intestines. Uh, I can tell you more about that later. Oh. Another one fun thing was uh, following a period recipe for pink, pink color, and, and uh, being really, really confused because it was green. And then learning that at that time period, the word pink referred to a shade of green. So I just say, I love when failures give you knowledge. Oh, that is the best. I'm a big fan of celebrating failures and uh... As is His Majesty. His Majesty, I think I've shared this before on on social media, but His Majesty has a big sign in his wood shop that says, "The master has failed more times than the novice has tried," and that to me is the epitome of a lot of what we do. It is, it's okay. You're going to fail, and you're going to get back up, and you're going to try again, and that is the best way to learn. I think the coolest thing I ever scienced was uh, when I made an appointment with the textile collection at the Victorian Albert which is a service that's available to anyone if you contact them enough ahead of time. And I was able to look at three pairs of knitted silk gloves with magnification while Dr. Susan North was there. And I was able to ask her about the gauge on the gloves and she measured it for me. Oh. So she actually got a couple of pins and set them at X number of stitches apart. And she calculated the number of stitches to the horizontal inch for me. That was about the coolest thing I've ever done. That and the magnification part on the gloves. That was very cool. We have you know, a lot of questions you, coming through. Yeah, know, they, give, they give you a little hand one or two answers for each of these, I think. magnifier. Very cool. So I'm going to run to Callum and I'm going to change the question on Callum. What's one key thing you would advise someone starting a new science? I'm the best experts. Yeah. Um, define what it is you want to learn from this. I mean, it, if you want to understand the how, that's different than I want the thing. And you know, once you've defined what your question is, what you're looking for, that at least gives you a, a direction that you can start mapping out for, for, this, for this thing that I want, this knowledge or this whatever. Now I've got a place I know to go towards. I can start looking at you know, what references are available to me. Are there people that I could speak to that know this thing? Can I start looking at historical examples that are related to this thing? And you know, that that's, starts moving you the direction. And don't be afraid of looking foolish. We all do. It's nothing bad. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. We all do. It's great. That's how you learn. Yeah. Let, let your curiosity guide you from there. Have fun with it. That's, that's a great point. I'm going to, I'm actually going to. Be, I'm going to have fun because this came in from Nikolai. So I'm going to ask Serena because I can. <laughs> what do you do? You see a real difference between arts and sciences, and what is that difference? So I've been thinking about that question. Um, I know a lot of people in the SCA say if you take a project, you throw it against the window, and a window doesn't break, it's art. If the window breaks, it's science. But I think that you can. Like science is the way and how you make the art. So everything is art, but also involves science um, because you have to you have to do it. And 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 this even counts for uh, performance arts. You you still have to do it. Um, and the the science part is finding out how you do it, how you well how you how you reliably replicate how it was done. And that's, that's the figuring out science part. And then the art is what is the result. That's what I think. 
Melissa went and got a a a, a prop. So this I'm is my, my art my art prop. Art. Uh, for me, as as a daughter of an artist and 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 a lover of art, art is communication. Science is the tools to help you communicate. I hadn't thought about it that way, but I like that a lot. All right, I'm going to change topics. I'm going to change questions again because I'm going to try and get through at least one answer to all of these. Um, so for Anne, how does using science in a project, in your opinion, improve the project in your own eyes? For me as the artist, it improves the project because it allows me to either get as close to the period as possible, which I personally like to do, or to understand why I couldn't get there. If it was something about modern tools, modern techniques, and that really falls into what printmaking is and why I enjoy it. Also why I teach taking the classes is I prefer to get my hands on things and do them. And so I'm all in see if this works kind of science and just trying it. A lot of the, for instance, printmaking and doing different textures you don't know how those textures are going to turn out until you practice the print. So you can do sit there. It's like doing an embroidery sample, or you can do a sample of the I want to do this texture for this subject, and does it work or does it not? And then you have to compare it to there's textures they used in period pieces that were used by some artists and some that weren't. So until you know how you can apply them. One thing I've learned, I learned really quickly from art school is every artist has their own voice. We all communicate our own way. We also have our own hand. So my style won't look like Millicent's style. Even if we all do the same picture, it would not look the same because we have a different hand. And the way we communicate through our drawing looks different. And for me, as much as I said drawing and I have a drawing behind me, I don't enjoy drawing. I draw when I carve the wood. So for me, that is that is my way to get my pictures to turn out the way I want them to. Um, and it's just really about process for me. And so getting it to where I want it to be, which most of the time is as close to period as possible. That's also something that art school taught me is there is really no such thing as perfect, especially if you have deadlines. They're an art competition or an art show or a grade. There has to be, you have to, as your own artist, say, this is good enough to turn in. This is good enough to be done with for now. Maybe I can go back and approach it a different way later, but I have to stop now. So I think I've rambled a little on that. Did that answer the question? That's good. No, I, I, that was that was fabulous and, and it was it was a good thought. Um, we have a couple more questions. I'm going to try and get through and then uh, I'm going to try and get this done at about five till so that we can all like transition to other classes that we need to be at. Um, so uh, um, let's see, what are your thoughts or advice on taking a huge category of interest and narrowing it down to one concept or experiment or project? Anyone? I think that's the way it kind of goes. Um, the the more you get interested in a thing, you you start out very broadly. Uh, like for I'll use myself as an example. I started out looking at since I think bugs are really neat. I looked at what bugs were important in period for really anything, and the first thing I found was silkworms, and that just happened to interest me. And then I started looking into how to rear them. And then eventually that went into how to rear, rear their silk. And now I just borrowed a loom from somebody because I'm gonna try to weave something out of the silk. And so it just sort of, it gets narrower and narrower as you follow your, your path through the questions that you ask yourself as to you know why or huh, and, and I think, it just narrows naturally. I don't think that you have to try to narrow it. And if you have to try to narrow it, then maybe you're not asking the right questions. Yeah, I think it's the opposite of the rabbit hole problem, the I want everything problem. Um, and I think that's where you have to stop and do a little soul searching of what is really exciting me about this? Is it the time period? Is it the technique? Is it the particular object? Um, and ask yourself those questions. You know, 
I listen to that inner voice. I'm going to give this one to Camilla because I know she's done a little bit of, of this sort of thing. What are your thoughts about gaps in data uh, when you can't conclusively correctly find out what was definitely the way something was done? How do you make reasonable substitutions? How do you decide what a reasonable substitution or decision on something is? Well, that's why I designed that experiment about the uh, materials used possibly for knitting needles. We've got a copper rod that's uh, 13th or 14th century from York, but we don't have any knitting that was buried concurrently with that. And then we have all this knitting that existed after that, but we don't have any surviving needles. We have other types of needles like hand sewing needles or even teeth and combs that have survived of similar materials, but we don't have knitting needles. So it's at that point reasonable to assume that they used possibly wood, maybe metal. That's why I designed that experiment because I asked the experts and I mean, I've got literature that's barely two or three years old and they just kind of slide over that topic. So it's time to see what I can find out, even if I'm living on the 38th parallel, which is kind of far south for the bulk of European knitting. So that's when you have to make a reasonable substitution to say, you know, I'm going to go with this because I have no other explanation. I've consulted the experts. They have no other explanation. I, I always go back to, to that no art exists in a vacuum. Yeah. You know, and, and sometimes the object you want, the tool you want is gone and unknown, but it's like you throw a rock into a pond and you're looking at the ripples. So you collect as many of those ripples as you can to guess the idea of that missing object. You start looking at what was possible and what would make sense and do the best you can, justify yep. the decision you make. If you're, if you're submitting it for an arts and sciences competition anyway, you justify your decision. Otherwise, you're the only person who's gonna know that you made a reasonable substitution and you roll with it. Um, with that being said, we are three minutes to the hour, which means I've got to shut this down as much as I would love to continue this forever and ever. Um, for everyone watching this now or in the future, I hope it has been beneficial. Um, and I hope that you will find uh, all of these lovely scientists, as well as many of the other amazing scientists we have in the mid-realm and the SCA, and use them as resources for helping you find your own art and how you can science it. I, for one, want to hear all about your experimentation, your knowledge gains, and your rabbit holes. And, and I want to celebrate them with you. So please don't hesitate to share them with me in person or on social media. Um, let's, let's science our arts together. Thank you all very much. Bye.